Hello, uh, this is your buddy Quinn. Welcome to the introduction to Ingmar Bergman's 1957 film, uh, The Seventh Seal. Uh, Ingmar Bergman is a Swedish director. Uh, the film was, was shot in a set in medieval Sweden. Uh, this is a historical film. It also has some fantasy elements uh, to it. Uh, and it's quite experimental in many ways. Uh, the setting for The Seventh Seal um, is uh, 14th century Sweden. Uh, during the middle of that century when uh, the plague known as the Black Death uh, was ravaging uh, Europe. Uh, there are some really important uh, themes in this film. Uh, this is a film about life. It's a film about death, uh, very explicitly about death because of its setting in the plague. And ultimately, this is a, a film about the possibility or the difficulties uh, of faith uh, in difficult times. Uh, we watched, uh, as part of this series, uh, Akira Kurosawa's film, Ikiru. Uh, Akira Kurosawa in Japan also set many of his films in the medieval period, in the Japanese medieval period, uh, during the samurai period. And uh, Ingmar Bergman was a fan of those films. In fact, he was inspired to make this film in part because of Kurosawa's success in setting some of his films uh, in medieval settings. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the director, Ingmar Bergman. Uh, we'll introduce the, the core uh, story idea uh, of The Seventh Seal, um, including the, the title and where that comes from. Um, discuss some of the characters and then dive into some of the really important themes of this film that make it so rich. And I will highlight some things uh, to watch out for as well. Uh, Ingmar Bergman uh, becomes uh, the most famous of all Scandinavian film directors. Uh, at the time of The Seventh Seal in 1957, he was not that person yet. Uh, but he grew up uh, in a very religious household. He was the son of a very well-known uh, conservative Lutheran minister uh, that had appointments uh, even up as, as high as the royal family. And so Ingmar's childhood was one in which he spent a lot of time in church. Uh, he was surrounded by religious imagery, religious language. Uh, as a boy, he actually uh, had some early encounters with death as well, in that he helped carry bodies from the royal hospital uh, where his father was chaplain uh, to the mortuary. Um, and uh, got to understand religious interpretations of life and death uh, in that context. He uh, does describe, he has two autobiographies, and he does describe uh, his life as one in which he had a series of faith crises, including one that was, was really quite early on, uh, in which the, the religious world, as depicted to him, uh, was not aligned with his experiences, or he, he had a lot of questions that, that uh, he had a very difficult time answering uh, using the religion of his father. Um, he becomes uh, an artist, right, a filmmaker. Um, he directs um, a large number of stage plays uh, in addition to uh, being a very prolific filmmaker. Uh, and his films are noted not only for some of the, the Scandinavian starkness, uh, of many of his films, but uh, he's very experimental. Um, he becomes one of the great directors of world cinema and is, is uh, uh, certainly the most well-known uh, of the Swedish directors today. Uh, in 1957, uh, The Seventh Seal really becomes the film that helps him transition to uh, international renown. So he was known for some artistic and experimental films, uh, largely in Scandinavia prior to this period, but in 1967, he uh, becomes uh, really well known, uh, in part uh, because The Seventh Seal becomes uh, an international hit. Uh, from the 1950s to the 1970s, which were his most productive uh, years, uh, he did many dozens of films. In fact, over the total of his long career, he directs about 60 films. Uh, this particular film uh, comes as the second film after which Bergman has received some international acclaim. Uh, a couple of years earlier, uh, he directed an important film called Smiles, uh, uh, Smiles of a Summer's Night, uh, which did very well at the Cannes Film Festival. 
this particular film uh, was an adaptation of Bergman's play. Uh, he wrote a play uh, called Wood Painting. It was based on a wood painting that he was aware of in a church in uh, Sweden from the medieval period in which death uh, is depicted as playing chess uh, with a man. Uh, this play, wood painting, was staged in Stockholm. Uh, it was uh, a film uh, adaptation uh, in which uh, the director of wood painting, uh, the play, uh, a man by the name of Bengt Ekerot, uh, is uh, the one that ends up playing the personification of death in this film. Uh, the title of the seventh seal uh, comes directly from uh, the book of, of Revelation, which is a revelation to St. John in the last, the last book in the New Testament. Uh, revelation is uh, an apocalyptic vision by St. John, and in John's vision there is uh, a scroll, uh, and that scroll is sealed. It has seven seals in it, and uh, on the scroll, um, is written the judgments of God upon the earth. Uh, and when a seal of that scroll is opened, um, angels um, or horsemen um, in the first four seals release a judgment upon the earth. And many of those judgments are, are fiercely destructive. The judgments upon the earth uh, play an important role in the film and Revelation chapter eight is quoted at the beginning and at the end of the film. Uh, Bergman started the script for this, for the play, and then later the film when he was sick in the hospital, so he was confronting his own mortality. Uh, it was rewritten five times. No one would actually produce this film until after the uh, success of, of Smiles of a Summer's Night um, from a couple of years earlier, uh, but it was produced on a relatively uh, tight budget and also a, a very short filming schedule of only 35 days. The 1950s, uh, when Bergman really makes his breakthrough, was a period in world cinema in which black and white films were starting to give way uh, to color films. Uh, early monopoly on color film technology had been broken. Uh, it was starting to spread. Uh, it was becoming very popular. And so by the middle of the 1950s in Hollywood, you, you see color films start to overtake black and white films. Uh, by 1957, when this film was done, there were still a lot of black and white films out there, but I'd, I'd like you to think a little bit about the importance of filming this particular um, movie on black and white film. So much of the imagery depends on this being in black and white. Uh, I think it would be really hard for the director uh, to do what he was uh, able to do thematically here if he was trying to film this, this in color. There will still be black and white films uh, throughout the rest of the 50s and also going on into the, the 60s but they become increasingly rare over time as, as people move um, to uh, color film, which becomes cheaper and cheaper. I'd like to talk a little bit about the, the core characters. Uh, there are uh, some really Im important characters, and I think it's, it's useful to have a, a basic overview of who's important in the film before you watch it. The most important central character is a knight. Um, his name is Antonius Block. Um, he's played by uh, an important actor named Max von Sydow, a Swedish actor who goes on uh, to have a career in many other Bergman films. Uh, he also ends up having a Hollywood career. He's even, um, as, as an older actor, he he's even plays a Jedi in uh, one of the, the later Star Wars, Wars films uh, where he's killed by Kylo Ren. So death uh, strikes him in Star Wars as well. Uh, he is the central protagonist, um, Antonius Block, this night, and he has returned from uh, a crusade uh, to the Holy Land uh, that he was uh, inspired to go on uh, by a character he later meets in the film. Um, he's returning as an older, wiser person, um, a little bit unsure as to whether or not the, the crusade was worth it, and he's returning to a, a plague-ravaged medieval uh, Sweden. He's accompanied uh, by a squire. Um, the squire in this film is named Jons. Uh, a squire historically was a knight's assistant. Early on, they would hold the shield. Otherwise, they would, they would also help manage the horses and 
uh, essentially be the wingman um, for a night. And we see Jans play that role uh, as they are returning back to their homes uh, in Sweden here. Uh, it would be easy uh, for the squire in this film to just be a side character or maybe a, a comedic character, but in fact, Jans plays a very important role. Uh, I see him as playing uh, the role of an interpreter uh, of what the knight and he are experiencing. Uh, he's a little bit cynical. Uh, he doesn't approach the world with a great deal of faith, but he it provides a running commentary on what they experience as they go. And so he, he, he is the interpreter of the film. Uh, there's also a, a, a wonderful character, probably my favorite character in the film, uh, is Death. And as I mentioned, uh, the previous director of the stage play, Banked Edgar Roach, plays Death. Uh, he's a real highlight. The way that Death is portrayed in this film ends up having an enormous influence on, on popular culture. Um, interestingly, the, the actor who plays Death, Edgar Roach, uh, was also personally quite self-destructive. He was an alcoholic. Uh, he ended up dying. Uh, early on in life. Um, in addition to those, those key three characters, uh, there is a troupe of actors. They're comedic actors. And they're going around from, from town to town, um, acting and providing entertainment in this very difficult time. Uh, the key three actors there are Jolf. Uh, he has a wife named Mia uh, and a son, Mikhail. Um, and they have also in their troupe a, a manager named Scott. Um, they play important roles as commentators as well. Uh, Mia, the, the wife in the acting troupe, is played by a woman named B.B. Anderson. Uh, she was romantically involved with Ingmar Bergman at the time and ends up becoming one of his go-to actresses uh, uh, over several decades uh, for many of his films. And I think she's a real highlight of the film. Uh, Yof uh, is played by a, a well-known uh, comedic actor in Sweden. His name is Niels Poppa. Uh, people would have known him as a comedian, and uh, he plays a kind of a comedic role in this film as well. But he also is a visionary man. <clears throat> he sees things that other people can't see. And so much of the film revolves around the idea of, of how do we know, right? What can we see? Uh, and so he, he's an important uh, actor and, and ends up uh, uh, being central toward the end of the film as well. Additionally, there's a woman uh, who ends up um, being accused of consorting with the devil. Um, she yeah, is considered a threat uh, to the community and a potential uh, cause of the plague. And so, uh, she is taken to be burned. Uh, I invite you to compare her story a bit to the, the story we've discussed previously in The Passion of Joan of Arc. Um, Passion of Joan of Arc is a movie that uh, Bergman would have known very well, uh, being important in his early life and, and being one of the most famous uh, films by a well-known Scandinavian director, Carl Theodore Dreyer. Uh, there are also some other townspeople who fear the plague uh, that, be, that play some minor roles, uh, some of of whom end up joining uh, the Knights group. Um, the central movement in this film is, is this group of people that are, are uh, moving, on the move. Some of them are moving, trying to run away from the plague, uh, go to safer parts uh, of Sweden. Uh, and then the Knight and his squire are trying to return home at the same time uh, from the crusade. Uh, one particularly notable uh, villager is a mute servant girl. Uh, she actually doesn't talk uh, in the entire film until the very end where she utters uh, a couple of words. Uh, this film is really rich in imagery and has a lot of thematic material. So uh, the seventh seal, as I mentioned, uh, comes from Revelation, specifically from uh, Revelation chapter 8, verse 1, uh, which says, And when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. Uh, in addition to the destructions that uh, this opening this seal causes, uh, one of the important aspects of this film is that key line in Revelation 8.1, which is there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. So silence of, of heaven, silence of God toward men uh, is one of the central themes of this film that I invite you to pay attention to. Uh, there's some discussion about the meaning of life and, and uh, potentially the pointlessness of life. Uh, 
the knight and the squire, I think, have several moments where they wonder about whether uh, it was a good idea to have gone on this lengthy crusade. Uh, in a really important confessional scene, we learn that the knight uh, wants to remedy that by performing one meaningful act in his life before he dies. And he's worried that death is going to overtake him, uh, in part because of the plague, and so um, he confesses in this, in this scene that he uh, wants to do this meaningful act and therefore needs to buy some time before death takes him. Uh, this is quite similar to the, the challenge that the protagonist of, of the Japanese film that we watched, uh, Akiru, uh, faces. And so uh, you might compare the theme uh, as treated in Akiru uh, to the one in The Seventh Seal. Uh, probably the biggest theme of the film is uh, the possibility of faith uh, and the difficulties associated uh, in uh, believing and acting in faith. Um, one of the questions that's raised here is how do we get through troubles, including very serious troubles like a plague, uh, without faith? Um, but at the same time, why do troubles seem to be meted out quite randomly? Um, what happens when you act in faith and you see God, but heaven is silent toward you? Um, is there such a thing as Satan? And if so, does, does the reality of Satan provide any insight into God's reality? Uh, one of my favorite lines in the film uh, describes faith as uh, a heavy burden. Um, why would that be the case? What, in what ways might faith be a heavy burden? There are also themes uh, in the, the film of love and themes of fear. So uh, what is love in this film? Um, is it a noble thing? Uh, at one point, love is actually compared to a plague. Uh, why might that make sense in the context of the film? Uh, there are a lot of scared people in the film. Um, uh, the knight is one of those, but there are others uh, who are scared. Uh, why are they scared? Um, what are they scared of? Um, in part, certainly they're, they're scared of dying, they're scared of catching uh, the Black Death. Uh, but there's also uh, an underlying fear that it goes even deeper than that, and that is uh, the terror of emptiness, right? Lack of meaning, uh, a lack of faith um, that the Knight uh, would really like to resolve over the course of this film. So uh, this is a really fun and rich story. There are a few things that I think make this film special that I'd like you to pay particular attention to. Uh, the intro sequence and the closing sequence are both very famous parts of this film. They starkly frame, frame the themes of the film. So watch the intro and the closing uh, carefully. Closing sequence uh, has a long, um, a long view shot, um, in which there is a little bit of a dance of death uh, going on. And that's a, a particularly famous scene because uh, Bergman, the director, had sent all of the actors home for the day, but then this cloud appeared on the horizon that he uh, thought provided just the right light for this kind of, of scene. So he hurriedly dressed up some of his um, production assistants, uh, even a couple of tourists that were there uh, visiting the countryside and uh, Put them in costume and, and was able to film uh, that scene very quickly before the light from the cloud disappeared. The cinematography here is really fantastic. There is so much uh, that Bergman does with light and dark in, in the cinematography that really echo the themes of light and dark in the film. Uh, there's a recurring theme of a chessboard in which white uh, and black, both on the board and in the pieces, uh, are in conflict with one another, that uh, visually really, really complement the, the themes that we're talking about of, uh, of faith and meaning. Um, and this is also quite a musical film. In fact, there are, there are some comedic moments, there are some lighthearted moments, there's music that is performed by uh, the actors, and then there's a very stark, visceral musical soundtrack as well that helps um, the viewer to think about moments of silence in the film versus moments of of very stark music or, or harsh noise. Uh, so think a little bit about that contrast in, in the soundtrack. Uh, the comedic actors in the film also, uh, I think, play a thematic role. So in addition to providing a little bit of, of uh, lighthearted um, downtime from the serious themes of the film, 
they end up um, acting in many ways like circus jet jesters. And they help to show some of the craziness uh, of what's going on in society, a lack of government, uh, you know, the order is completely missing in this film. There's no uh, intervention from the state. Um, and so society is kind of left on its own to, to grapple with this challenge. Um, these comedic actors, I think, end up showing some of the craziness of the plague and, and craziness of what people are going through. Um, it echoes in my mind the, the circus uh, scene uh, in the town, town square at the end of The Passion of Joan of Arc. Um, I invite you to think a little bit about what Bergman gets out of putting this film in a medieval setting. Uh, not all aspects of his medieval setting are historically accurate. There are some anachronisms there. Um, many of his, his films are, are modern set films as well. But this one, he very explicitly plays into the medieval setting. Um, and uh, that allows him to do a few things, right? Uh, there are lots of, of references uh, to things that would be out of place in a modern setting. There are lots of superstitions, ill omens, and relatively rough social behavior that might not work very well in a modern context. But think a little bit about uh, why the medieval setting becomes important for, for his message here. Uh, this is actually a film that uh, inspired other medieval set films as well, including uh, Monty Python's The Holy Grail. There are some, some sequences from this film that are parodied in, parodied in that film. Uh, on the surface, this is a very simple story. Uh, it's a story of a returning knight. It's a story of how he, he goes home, uh, the challenges that he faces as he goes home. But uh, it's a very, very layered story. Uh, this is the kind of film that uh, really benefits from a, a second or third watch uh, after you've had a chance to think a, a little bit about it. But there are many layers of meaning that explore the meaning of human existence uh, on top of that, that simple story. Uh, many stories have heroes. Um, I think it's an open question as to whether this, this movie has heroes. Um, that would be something that would be good to think about and discuss. Uh, if, if there are heroes, who are they and, and what makes them heroes? And if not, if not uh, is it possible to have a film uh, without heroes? Uh, the knight is on a quest of sorts, right? Uh, is, he, he wants to redeem himself by performing one meaningful act in his life. Does he do that? Uh, is he satisfied at the end? Uh, it's an open question. And finally, I'll just say that, that this is the first of uh, seven, a right, really remarkable number, seven Bergman films that really wrestle with questions about whether faith is possible uh, in modern times. This is a medieval setting, but it's really dealing with the crisis of modern faith that, that emerges after the horrors of the Holocaust are well known. So if, if you think about um, Europe coming to grips with the Holocaust at the end of the, the 1940s and early 1950s, um, the Black Plague and the seemingly absence of, of God's hand in that uh, is, is often similar to the, the existential crisis that many people felt uh, in Europe after the horrors of the Holocaust became well known. Uh, simultaneously, you also have the possibility of nuclear uh, uh, destruction, right? a nuclear holocaust. And that also challenges many of the traditional structures of faith and belief. And so uh, if you like this film, you may really want to uh, think about watching other Bergman films that explore uh, this, this theme. Uh, Winter Sleep is a really important one that comes a, a number of years later. But uh, many themes uh, explore the possibility of faith in a very challenging uh, and, and difficult modern period. Um, I hope you enjoy The Seventh Seal. Um, I find it to be extremely thought provoking. It's not always immediately likable because it's, it's quite a challenging film in some ways, uh, but it's guaranteed to uh, get you to think and guaranteed uh, to have imagery that lasts uh, for a long time and, and uh, provokes uh, many reflections on some of the questions that I've introduced here.